Is it gonna make me rotate this way again? I'm gonna go insane. Um, Luke just called me, so I realized I better hurry up. Cause what happened is I had to go find worms for my for my uh, fish. So we got the worms, but I set the live stream up before I got the worms. So let's see if we can flip this around. And hello, everybody. Yes. No. Ugh, it's not gonna let me. It's not gonna let me rotate it. But I guess we're stuck in landscape mode. I have no idea why it does this from time to time. But this little fella has gone from being the shyest fish in the fish room to being the most outgoing. And uh, he's about five inches long right now. And he is a hungry, hungry. Uh, little pumpkin seed fish that I caught uh, locally so he's been here now three weeks I guess I didn't really share the fact that he was here uh, right away because uh, I wanted to make sure he did okay and everything I didn't want to be like hey I got a fish and then like a dummy introduce a cool water species to a fish room that's 75 degrees and find out that it didn't work out I had a f pretty good feeling it would work out though in that the water I caught him in gets easily 78, 80 degrees in the mid summer months. So I figured he'd be all right. But let's start off with him. Um, since he is the cause of me having to hunt down all these worms all the time. So we'll start with him. And he's actually got a little friend in the tank. He's got a lady friend in the tank right now, and oh, well, he ate that so fast. We'll get him more. Um, but he has a lady friend in the tank, so I'm curious if she'll come out, if he'll lay off for a second, because he's just so aggressive. She doesn't really want anything to do with him most of the time. Um, hold on trying to put some nutrient powder on the worm before I give it to him come on this season we've had some of the biggest worms I've ever seen here look at him he's just ready to go and lucky for me I don't have to hunt down a bunch of worms because this guy will eat them all but this is the only uh, should we say graphic part of feeding uh, this fish in that he won't eat any flake food but I don't see his lady friend hiding anywhere in here and I've tried to make it really similar to his wild habitat uh, he it looks like he's gonna eat that whole worm no problem um, sometimes he kind of regurgitates stuff but uh, he he is a total pig he eats I mean easily he'll he'll eat a quarter of his body weight in a day if you feed him morning noon and night but yeah how's everybody doing I figured we'd have some different people in here uh, we've got uh, a youtuber what's up we've got Luke who gave me a call we've got Stephen P it's got to be real early for you Bobby's Fishy Tales from New Zealand, or Bob's Fish Tales. Chew, what's up? Cave of Wonders, hello, my friend. Um, Orchids and Endlers, hello. And Jack27, and Michelle, what's up? Oh, and Liquid Zoo, man, you don't sleep either. Uh, Rich Holdings, what's up? And Baradina Faloth, hello. Caught me live. Yeah, we're feeding the... Oh, he's not quite done with the worms. We're feeding the sunfish. Now what's interesting, since I've gotten the sunfish, um, or specifically the uh, Lepomis gibbosus, and I think he's going to be named Gibby or Gibson, um, or maybe both. <laughs> uh, Alina, or I'm assuming it's Alina. Hello, welcome. And the Greek Animal Keeper. Hello from Greece. Right on. I'm so glad we've got some folks from around the world 
tuning in. So you're looking at a native Seattle fish. Well, the last two, the last 150 years, these guys have become native. Technically speaking, they weren't native. Um, they were brought here by early settlers and Native Americans uh, who wanted to bring edible fish that can survive in a wider array of uh, habitats out into the mountains and stuff. Um, if you can look closely, you can see he's actually regurgitating all the slime and the soil that the worms have in them. And this is what these guys eat when I go watch them in the ponds locally. They look for grubs and worms more than anything. He, uh, they, they, um, hey, Gem Aquatics, welcome. Uh, they really like eating worms, grubs, and you can see it's gross, but there's that slimy trail coming down from his gills where he's regurgitating out the mucus that he doesn't want from the worm, too. Um, and they've evolved that, I guess. They've evolved the pharyngeal flap as well that makes it so they can uh, kind of hold it in their gill area. And now you can see all the uh, material coming out. Uh, so he doesn't have to digest that earth-like material that the worms are always creating. So it's kind of interesting when you watch them digest. Carl from Belgium, hello. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, he's, uh, he's doing his thing. And you can see when he eats, the blue in his face gets a lot more blue and less turquoise. Don't know why that is, but that's just the color change that occurs. And you can see he's just drooling this nasty worm stuff from his mouth. And I kind of wondered if, if, you know, if that's what worms do as a defense mechanism or if this is just how panfish, because they eat so many worms, if they have just evolved this ability to get rid of all the inessential filler that worms have. Um, but yeah, his red has gone away a little bit. He has a bright orange and red belly most days. Kind of like his ear there, the marking on his ear. If you guys are watching and uh, enjoying, we're going to feed all the tanks tonight um, and just hang out, chat a little bit, figure. Um, over here, we've got the Malawa tank. And uh, the blue Malawas, you can see how outnumbered they are right now. I need to do some heavy-duty culling. You can see, well, there's a pregnant blue Malawa right there. But look at all the normal ones. They're all right here. Tonight would be a good night to do some culling. And there's a yellow one right there. Um, and, uh, yeah, so they're doing their thing. They're eating. There's a few red ones about, too. But the blue ones, this is the blue mother colony, so to speak. So it needs to be kind of spruced up and uh, culled because, obviously, there are a lot of non-blue shrimp in here with them at the moment and that's because I've been sending out so many shrimp also trying to uh, raise funds I'm gonna try to get a new laptop plus I'm gonna try to travel to some more events uh, in the near future to bring you guys more material but in this tank we've also got um, some of these these guys that I need to feed if you can see them barely they're real skinny those are uh, half beaks Oh, here we go. Here's an interesting Malawa. This is a red one on the glass here that is pregnant, so she's going to shed again, but you can see the tips of her tail are all that's red. So she has that red gene, but not fully, which I didn't even know was possible until very recently when I started to see it. You can see it, they're probably the same generation in this one, too. Not quite as distinct, but yeah. Anyhow, so these guys, what they're eating tonight, and we've got a lot of pregnant ones on the way, so I need to literally cull them later tonight because I don't need them having babies, even though a bunch of the babies will be blue. Uh, yes, and Johnny, I am selling my Malawas. That's why so many of them are not blue. This tank used to be 80 to 90% blue, and now you're seeing the red strain like this guy, or gal, I should say. She's got eggs. Um... And the red strain is fine because their eggs 
their babies uh, are about 80% blue usually. Uh, if they're first generation red, if they're red throws as I call them, like this one right here. And then those clear ones are wild ones that look just like the ones you'd find it anywhere. And those are the ones I get rid of and uh, put in other tanks and clear out from the blue tank. But this is how I feed them to get, you know, all of them up front out of a 40 breeder. Uh, you get a pretty good number of them uh, out of them. And, you know, you end up, I feed usually two things and that is, um, I feed Envy, the growth Envy, and then I also do uh, Shell Envy because my water's so soft here. So that way there's stuff. But I really like these products the way uh, Rob them over at Shrimp Envy down in Oregon. And uh, yeah, so that's what's causing this pile up of shrimp. And then if I don't have that or in the nights in between on the tanks that I do feed, because some tanks, I don't even feed some shrimp tanks because they just eat algae for me. But this is the other, like, go-to that I can get at any big store, um, is the spirulina-based algae wafers made by Hikari. Um, and those are, like, you know, that and the Hikari-based crab food, uh, crab and crustacean food or invertebrate food, very very popular for the shrimp colony um but yeah you can see um hey george what's up and joe what's up and yeah i have pseudomagills also we're gonna definitely feed everybody i just wanted to kind of take note for myself too because i haven't seen all these shrimp out together at you know two in the morning my time uh in a while and here's what that Shrimp Envy food looks like up close. Um, it's it's mostly uh, like nettle and spirulina based. And it breaks down into like a powder. You don't want to serve one whole chunk really. You kind of break it up into pieces ideally. Or smash it with a hammer and then toss it. the dust in. Works fine too. Um, but right now what I'm learning... And this is why I like feeding my shrimp at night. Is one, they are going to have the least color right when you turn on the lights at night. And that tells me like, okay, I do still have some red ones in here. Um, and then my blue ones are just, I need to strictly start calling again. Because for a while, I was coming out with probably 90% blues in this tank. And clearly there's in a, a complete generation of adults that aren't blue in here but there's you know a nice blue one there all the ones up higher seem to be blue i don't know why that is but they the ones that graze up in the obvious places seem to be blue usually um so yeah all right but that tank's doing its thing up here we've got the lucanusi um or lu Lucanusi, <laughs> Lucanzii, however you want to say it, um, named after Oliver Lucanus, and uh, they're in here, hold on, they'll come out in a sec, they're just being kind of shy, but we'll, we fed one of them, and I gave one of them an earthworm earlier, and that got eaten up quickly, um, Alex, you have fluval bug by algae Chris. I swear, none of my bud, uh, none of my bottom feeders touch it. Um, yeah, there's certain things out there that fish, yeah, they just don't like that I bought on the market. They just won't even touch. Honestly, tropical tetra tropical granules. That's one that my fish hate. Um, after feeding them high quality food, they just hate it. So see these cichlids. They're beautiful and in color right now. This is the Enigmatochromus uh, Lucanusi or Lucanzi, Lucan, Luc, whatever. Named after Oliver Lucanus. And I've been talking with him because he has a really cool uh, YouTube channel called Below Water. And it's footage of biotopes around the world underwater. 
Um, anyways, I don't know why they're being so shy. We'll get back to feeding this guy one more time. You can see here he's done drooling, so he's probably ready for his next worm. But I don't see his lady friend. And this, for, for um, the person who asked, uh, this is a sunfish of which America has many sunfish or panfish as we call them too. And this one is a five, maybe six inch max long um, sunfish that is uh, a pumpkin seed fish is the name commonly. But what he is is a Lipomus gibosis or gibrosis. Um, and they are a warm water dwelling, lowland dwelling fish from the Midwest, but now they're found all over Europe and all over America and have been for 200 to 150 years or so. Since around 1820 or so is when people started moving them all over the place. But, uh, it, yeah, now they're everywhere. So we're going to try to feed him again, see if he's hungry at all. This one might go to the bottom until later. But, we'll see, we'll see what he does. Uh, and I don't see his, his little girlfriend who, who was in here. Um, she's either hiding behind this rock, or he has dispatched of her, which is a very real possibility, which would be very sad. Uh, but I'm not sure if they're able to coexist in a tank that's only, uh, a 55, and this is a weird 55, it's like a bow front custom, uh, that I got off somebody years ago, um, but yeah, Earthworm Jim, yeah, Earthworm Jim's having a bad day, he's gonna go hide, um, but anyways, he'll, he'll dig out those worms later, so I'm not gonna feed him more worms until he's ready, so probably tomorrow morning he'll, he'll get more, um, and, uh, yeah, I don't want to just feed him worms, but that's what he really likes. He also seems, I've been collecting things like that. Oh, and here's the, here's the little cichlids to show you guys. Very pretty, but you have to catch them just at the right angle to, to see all the blues and, and yellows and purples that are in their, in their, um, patterning. And that's the male that was up, but the female has been hanging out very, very, close to home, which for them, here's that, ma oh, he just startled them, but that male, he's chasing something away from their little log that they've been hiding under, so I think they're getting ready to spawn again, and I think there might just be too many Malaysian trumpet snails in here, because all their spawning seems to be met with no babies appearing. I've never seen babies appear with them, even though I see them in their spawning color, and, you know, they protect against these other fish really well. Um, but yeah. Oh, right. The other thing I was going to tell you, I'm, I'm breeding these right now, these little blue tetras. These are called uh, mete tetras or purple tetras, even though they're bluish to turquoise colored. Come on, show your face. Um, I hate that the screen is stuck this way, guys. I have no idea how to fix this issue that happens every third or fourth time I stream. Um, uh, but it does seem to happen. Oh, look, his orange is returning to his face and his, his colors are, are turning back to light blue or turquoise. And if you were watching, he was just dark blue. But yeah, this is the sunfish. And now he's going to go hunt for those worms, or that worm that got past him, probably. Um, just had to fully digest it. Uh, so, yeah, alright. So, the next up on the menu is going to be something I have to be careful with. But here's my little food stand. I have an arsenal of, of food <coughs> choices, including a bunch of shrimp envy types, all of them, actually. The Hikari Crab Cuisine. These, which should be refrigerated or frozen. Um, must have forgot the other night. 
This, which is one of my favorites, which is actually just aquarium co-op's bulk fry food. If you need to feed little teeny fish just something and barely add to the bio load, that's a good one. This is for my mid-sized cichlids. I have a floating and a sinking version. Good for quarries, good for gouramis, good for cichlids, loaches. And then over here in this tank right now, um, we've got the Radnocentris ornatus. We've got the uh, the the pretty. Um, hey, what's up, Ian? Man, Midnight Alex is my favorite. Well, it's past midnight, man. I've turned into a pumpkin. Um, and uh, this tank right now is absolutely full of uh, baby fish. So some of them are this size, and they're clearing out all the really tiny ones. But there's some tiny, tiny, tiny little little ones that are being born every week or so. At least one of the females. There's three females and two males of these um, honey garamis. And this guy here is guarding, or this gal rather, is guarding the eggs she laid, which are up here. You can kind of see them in between the duckweed right here, maybe. Um, and she's been fighting off fish for two days, so they should be hatching any second now. I mean, maybe tonight they'll hatch. But... They usually make a little foam nest, and voila. So, the concoction that I have ready, and I've got my botanical arsenal here, and my, uh, but the concoction we've got here for tonight's service is the Blood Worm Bloody Mary, and, uh, it is, uh, baby brine shrimp, live, um, seed shrimp, uh, ostracods, live scuds, and I usually don't do the live scuds if I'm feeding some sort of micro fish, like nano fish I should say, um, just because they're, they can be problematic, and same with, um, any sort of, uh, any sort of shrimp, but these guys are just showing off beautifully right now, so now you can see that we've got some blood worms, and these are blood worms that are frozen, but they've also been chopped, so I chopped them up, um, and you have to be careful with thread fins, thread fins will choke on blood worms if you're not careful, so you have to be careful and make sure you don't get full size large blood worms, also you can see that my dojo loach is going nuts, he can smell what's, whatever I'm putting in the water obviously, um, and he's excited, but the pseudomagills are eating the blood worms too. You have to be careful for them too. So it's just all around you gotta be careful. So I'm also gonna put most of the blood worms of that load right here in with my Megoptera. And these I got from Jason over at Redfish Bluefish. These are a newer uh, discovery in the Epistogramma family. And they have the largest dorsal fin of any episto. So you can see he's getting sea shrimp, daphnia, blood worms. And he already ate. Did he eat them all? Let's see. He ate, yes. So there was a pile of chopped up worms here. He got two whole worms for him and his, his female. That's. I think she may actually be on eggs. Because she has not come out now for two days. More than just her face coming out of that coconut right there. And uh, the water, the pH in their tank right now is really low. Uh, probably too, almost too low for this nearite. Uh, the pH in this tank is something like, uh, oh, there she is. Here she comes. So she's probably not sitting on eggs then if, if she's ready to leave. Oh, no, she went right back. So I don't know. She, she still could. It's still a possibility. All right, so now we're watching the Pseudomagill Luminatus, who, by the way, I was really, really, uh, hey, thanks uh, for reminding folks about the, the hitting the like button, and if you, ever guys, if you guys ever want to know who's streaming in the middle of the night, 
uh, go to fishfam.link and, uh, you know, fishfam link will, uh, will help you out knowing who's streaming when and, uh, any scheduled events or auctions or giveaways or, you know, all sorts of stuff. So, very handy little website he has created there. Thanks, Matt. And, um... Yeah, so Pseudomagill Luminatus, and then there's two types of thread fin here. So we've got the normal thread fin that you see in the hobby all the time, and that's kind of your, um, I don't know, plain and striped. It has some stripes on the side and an orange peachy tail. And then there's the ones that have a really strong purple tail that, that Gary Lang introduced again into the hobby, that one there. Uh, and Aquarium Co-op had these purple tail ones recently, and it's probably sacrilegious, but I mixed them just because I needed some more males, believe it or not. I had too many females. Uh, so, also the Samurai Garami, or Chocolate Samurai Garami, as they're sometimes known, they're in here. Uh, and this water is pretty acidic as well. The TDS in this water is under 100. So I used distilled or RO water um, for it. Here's a little male uh, of the of the persuasion of the chocolate garamis, and he just doesn't seem to grow very much. So I don't know if he's going to stay smaller or what. But the two females are way more colorful and way larger. So I kind of want to go see if I can get one more male. And, and see if I can find one that's going to be a little bit bigger. Because they have a throat pouch and they're supposed to have babies that they hold in their throat pouch. And right now you can see the light shining through him. And you can see that he's actually practicing aerating his throat pouch. You can see that kind of chugging of the throat. That would be filled out like a dewlap on a lizard um, when it's time to have a baby. Or hold babies rather. So then we've got the other female over here, and she's just electrically colored. Hold on. Let's get the light on her. Um, she's just lit up like a Christmas tree, too. We've got the Borneo loach here. Uh, can we not get... It's... Oh, there we go. Now it's focusing. Uh, Speckled Jim, what's up? How's it going? And George RB3, what's up, buddy? So we're going back to the cocktail cup. The, the Bloody Mary cocktail cup. And the blood worms are all at the bottom. But to get stuff for small fish, uh, like small pieces of blood worms and all the, uh, all the other stuff that I concocted in there, like for these guys, for the drape fin barbs, they're going to get a mix of blood worms and... Uh, and all of this stuff. Even my shrimp, making sure that there's no seed shrimp or anything in there, are going to get some of the blood worms and daphnia and baby brine shrimp. These are caradina shrimp here. These are all tangerine tigers. And they're doing well. No filter, no tech. And then over here... We're gonna cloud up the water. We've got um, we've got my beautiful ruby bar or ruby tetras uh, that I love because I know when they lose their color, the water uh, quality is going down. We've got some platinum madakas up here, and then we've got a whole big group of these freshwater bumblebee uh, gobies, and now we have panda loaches. And I'm not seeing many of the panda loaches, but I see one. I only was able to afford six. They're kind of expensive. And by kind of, I mean like $30 a piece usually. Um, but I want to get a group of like 15 to 20. Yeah, here comes more. And they will eat blood worms, um, kind of. They'll suck on them a little bit. And then what they really want is biofilm. And that's what makes them kind of difficult is they don't even so much want algae like some places say. They want biofilm. And they've only been here a few days and they've already cleaned the biofilm 
to a crazy degree in here. Um, just the six of them. And it's only a 10 gallon tank. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> but, there's that. Crazy dojo loach. So, it looks like the water is getting pretty clear up here. So, we're going to do give them another round. Hopefully, less blood worms in this. Um, but, we'll give them another round of all the little stuff. There we go. And over here we've got my wild betta. And not only wild bettas, now we have the Tanixis minnows uh, from Vietnam in here too. And uh, they're hovering about low. I need to clean the glass. I, I just literally hate cleaning the glass, obviously. Um, but we're going to give them what they want and then also we have beta maha chiensis chilling up here and there's five of them they're still juveniles and they're babies from my adult pair of beta maha chiensis that are living up here and then we've got my uh beta malik uh that are right here another wild beta and you can see here one of them i don't know if that's the male or the female i can't tell yet We'll find out in a moment. But these Beta Maliks, boy, I gave them a couple worms each, and they are able to power through all the worms. They're able to power through all the food I can throw their way. It is wild how much they eat these wild caught ones that Lawrence brought me. Um, and they have a lid on their tank that I'm feeding them through. Uh, and there's the male, he's colored up, and they're going to be, um, they're, they're mouth brooders as well. And so the male, hard to see his colors with the angle of the light, and them being up six feet high. But the female's a lot bigger than the male. And here's the male, yeah, you can see his colors there. But he'll be the one to carry the babies. Now we need to feed her. That's the female, Beta Maha Chiansis here that is the mother to all the ones in here. And uh, let me get them some more blood worms too. Blood worms, you get a blood worm, you get a blood worm, you get a blood worm. The nice thing about this stuff, you know, blood worms, if they don't get eaten, they can cause an ammonia spike because of the nature of what they are. But, they, uh, if you have shrimp and if you have snails, it's nothing like overfeeding flake food. Like for two bettas, that's probably way too much food right there, but there's a bunch of snails in here, so it'll be fine. And beyond that point, I even feed this, uh, as I call it, my healthy mixture. I even feed it to my scud tank and my uh, paramecium tank so that these guys have all the protein and vitamins possible in them so there's that all right let's get these guys some more you can see there's still stuff floating in the water a bit but we'll get them just a touch more of the um, intermediate mix of stuff and again this tank plenty of snails so it'll be all right and I don't really love water changes so that's another thing that I don't want to do and it leads to me underfeeding to some degree but here we want to see all these little fellas eating well even if it means that we got to keep snail crew on board Malaysian trumpet snails bladder snails and ram's horn snails uh, and shrimp in order to keep them happy. Now here we've got um, drape barbs. Now check this out. I fed some of these drape barbs right before you guys started watching. And already this one here, you can see like a blood color at the belly or the cloaca. That is the worm piece that that one ate earlier. 
um, so that quickly in just a matter of I don't know 15 minutes 20 minutes they have that going through their body so they fish really uh, most fish really don't digest their food um, well all right now this tank is kind of my Alex what are you what the heck are you doing tank as it is turned into green water but there are haplochromus in here there are enigmatochromus in here um, there are down here there are um, the very unusual mustard synodonis which has look at these whiskers if we can see them <clears throat> we can't probably too much algae uh, and then we have the normal cuckoo catfish synodonis uh, but we got about six of the synodonis uh, in here the cuckoo catfish and look they'll just hover up all these worms like so quick that was an entire turkey baster that they've almost cleared out already uh, and there's still a couple shy fish over in the corner so I'm gonna come back and hit them also um, and I believe the mustard uh, the mustard um, Catfish or mustard synodonis is the abolitus or abolitus, but it has forked, um, and then these are the haplochromus that uh, Lawrence Kent brought me. Now this water has turned into green water, partially because it's right next to the big window, and partially, I don't really know to be honest. The, the other part is a mystery, so uh, there's that. But we're going to continue on. We're going to feed my dojo loaches. They'll get a little taste of blood worms. They'll, they'll usually eat some. And then uh, also in here are my, come on, my live bears, if you can, if we can see them. It's hard because all this stuff makes it so dark. And this light is so weak. This Aquion light. So weak. Um, but then we need to feed this tank too. So we'll get them going and see how hungry they're going to be. The Garamis and the Tetras and the, and the uh, Cichlids. A lot of times I like to kind of feel the waters out and literally see... All right, who's going to eat how much of what? But when you've got the tannins in the water and some minerality and uh, and all this frozen and live food, man, you get better colors. Like these red phantoms and serpes that I have in here, um, they look so pretty right now. They're so colored up. I love it. And the shrimp continue to pile on. I mean, there's just more and more. Now we're seeing more blue. Uh, but they kind of segregate. The non-blue ones are kind of all in one pile, too. Uh, so kind of interesting there. And let's see here. So then we've got this tank, which is the Hong Kong Longfin. And we've got hovering loaches over here. And we've got uh, uh, Beckford Eye pencil fish also. Uh, these are all ones that have bred in my uh, care. And a lot of times, even though I just used no planaria a few months ago, I get planaria still uh, from time to time sneaking out of who knows where some crevice in the tank annoyingly and uh, in this case in this uh, yellow shrimp tank I have uh, I can also see that there's baby um, scuds being born in the substrate right here so I'm just suctioning them up and I'm literally just going to put it over in this tank, which we've got everything from uh, little exclamation point rasboras that I've spawned. Um, 
they actually spawned in this tank, in this Sawasser tank, because it's so tangled. They were able to survive. And then we've got the white cloud minnows that are the man-made form from Hong Kong with the yellow. And then the little hovering loaches that are eating, happily eating bloodworms. Hold on, sorry about the reflection. Eating bloodworms. These guys are just little baby size. I just got six of them. Then we've got the betta that's trying to eat, I don't know, three worms at once, blood worms. They're piggies. Um, but yeah, so this tank, and then we've also got Aspidoras in here uh, that I love. The six raid quarry or the Aspidora, they're extremely shy. It might be because they're wild caught, but they're extremely shy. Um, I've had very poor luck even getting them to pose for a picture, these, these guys here. They just don't want to hold still. I mean, traditionally these hovering loaches don't want to hold still for a picture either, but look at him, he's in heaven just eating all these little baby brine shrimp and decapsulated baby brine shrimp and uh, other little daphnia and seed shrimp. Here comes one of those aspidoras right here. So they just kind of look like a longer salt and pepper quarry. We've got another loach, hovering loach, eating bloodworm, taking it to go, saying, I'm going to munch on this over in the corner. And then we've got my uh, bettas up here, the betta splendens. And uh, we're going to give them some food. My baddest tank is going to get a little bit of food. I'll look at the chat in a sec, guys. Um, but. Bettas, baby bettas, and juvenile bettas, they're getting their food. Same within here. She's getting hers. She's about ready to lay eggs again. You can see how full her belly is. And, uh. Then we'll give this poor lonely buddy uh, some blood worms. Like I said, even in my scud tanks, and this is a scud tank and an ostracod and a black worm tank, I give them this magic mix of protein because I don't want them just eating algae. Now, over here, we have a setup. I hate that this thing is in standing mode or vertical mode, but we've got a little thing I got at a dollar store in uh, the International District here in Seattle. Uh-oh. Watch me sink my own project. Hold on, guys. Trying to do this all one-handed. Um... But, in this little tub here, I'm feeding them, and what we have there is those blue mate, uh, tetras, and they're floating in there, but the bottom has a bunch of holes in it that they can't fit through, but that their eggs can, so hopefully... This tank, which has very acidic water with almost no TDS in here, hopefully they lay some eggs from this thing in the next two or three days, and then I'll move them. But I would just want to get more of those in my tanks for sure. Now, this tank has cleared out a lot of what I've given them already. So, let's give them a little more. Here comes, there we go. Now you guys can see why I love the color on those Lucanusis or Lucons. I can never say it right. Lucanusi, Lucons, I, Lucanusi, whatever. Um, all right, so who's next? I guess these guys are next. And Mama's going to get some food. Other mama, other mama. See, I just know where they hang out now. 
other mama. Chopras will come in. The tin winnies will come in. The uh, if I put blood worms in, the lake inlay loaches will swoop in. Come on, Lake Inlay Loaches. I know you're around, although it is kind of late for them. They tend to eat in the mornings more. But, yep, there's the Tin Winnie. There's the Chopras. And the CPDs will be coming any moment now, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, there's another Tin Winnie there. Or Gold Ring Daniel, as they're often known. And... Here come all the Chopras that are missing eyes. Why are they missing eyes? I have no idea why these wild ones, almost all of them, ended up missing an eye. And yes, uh, somebody mentioned that it looks hot in my fish room. It is. It's real hot in the fish room. And uh, because of that, I am sweating. Now, all the little Aspidoras are out, but as soon as I get close to the glass, they hit the road. Uh, they're real shy. Boy, look at all these baby shrimp right now in the, in the, uh, no-tech shrimp tank. So we started, had an issue, dropped to eight adults, and now we're back up to this many little baby shrimp in a two and a half gallon tank without the filter or anything. There's more back around the other side and hiding randomly. Um, but yeah, so... This whole method of using a 1299 light and uh, raising them has worked pretty well. And in fact, I have some tangerine tigers living in here too, just to see if they can live in a little bit harder water um, than in the past. Because this that line has gotten so much more hardy every few years. It gets better and better. And uh, I'm kind of just pushing the limit. Push it to the limit. Um, now, what I may do is take these cichlids out, if I can catch them, which is a nightmare, uh, and give them their own tank. This is, uh, Guppy Project tanks over here. Don't really want to share what I'm up to with those at the moment, but I'll give you guys a sneak peek. Still working with the bell bottoms, and, uh... While I'm working with guppies and endlers, I always also work with shrimp. So if we can find them, yeah, here you go. Some blue dream shrimp scooting around in here. These are the coals from my other blue dream tank. Um, but yeah, they're doing their thing. Let me go grab. Alright, so everybody's got their food in this room now, pretty much. I think, yeah. Yes. Everybody's got their food. Or at least some of it. So now we're going to hit the main community tanks. surprise these Corys, these Sturbys, there's a little something to talk about, and then we'll feed this tank too, and they're just going to get the rest of the cup, because they also got dibs on the first round before the show even started, they got a couple snacks. So then I always wash out the turkey baster too. And my other epistos right here, the Hong's Lilai. Here's the male and he is in spawn mode also. Um, now you can see my plants though. They've gone to bed for the night. See how they've closed up? Uh, all the kabambas are closed. Oh, almost all of them. Uh, and 
they're just doing their thing as plants. And we've got the black tetras, black phantom tetras. We've got the um, rummy nose. We've got this Hong's low eye that's so curious. There's that male that's all colored up. Blue and pink. I mean, look at those colors. And then a neon pink eye, which is so cool. I don't know any other fish that has that neon pink eye. Um, like a lavender eye. And we've got the black angelfish. Then we also have up top. Oh, and we've got the Venezueliana orange quarries in here. Doing their thing. But then we have, where are they? The pencil fish. The Equus pencil fish are usually at the top on one side or the other. They kind of clump together. Yeah, they're up here doing their thing. So there's five or six of them there. And then poor Buddy. She can't catch a break. She's been hiding in the very back of the tank for a week now. And I've been spot feeding her, and I need to get her a new home. Because it just, they've been smelling her, they've been in the water with her, and it's just not working out. They're just not, they're not going to be friends, apparently. So, that is a real bummer. <laughs> this Anubius coffifolia is ginormous. I had no idea that coffifolia had leaves like this when immersed. It's insane. Now that this room, it's turning into summer and spring, uh, it's catching the sunlight from outside. And you'll notice I didn't feed this tank with the gold barbs in it because uh, that tank doesn't get food. I've only fed it a couple times. Uh, yeah, Luke, if, if, if you live closer, I would... Uh, I would definitely send her it over. Hold on, I don't want to make you guys dizzy turning, but these Hong's Loai are such aggressive fish. They may play shy, bashful at first, but we know their tricks. The female is pretty shy. She is probably going to stay hidden, but she'll poke her nose out somewhere and eat. And we've got one of the jelly bean tetras left. And over here we've got the stirby quarries and uh, blue dream shrimp, which are still just chugging along. And then we've got the uh, nano pencil fish. Um, what else do we have in here? Oh, the 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 itty bitty teeny weeny little. Uh, Plecos, snowball plecos, and uh, then we've got the yellow polka dot, as they're called, which I don't like that name really, but the yellow polka dotted um, rasboras or micro rasboras that, that are swimming somewhere around here, should probably make them some more room. And that light just coming in has caused these plants to grow about two inches a day out of the water. And here now we can see the red-tailed pencil fish and the... I need to trim all this out and clear out what's in the back because it's not really useful at this level of density other than that these pencil fish have been breeding that I've had some babies pop up, but not in any number that really warrants this mess that I have on my hands of this level of density and this situation going on with a filter that's barely even working. I don't even know why it's on, honestly. Um, and my Persicaria maculatus is blooming, and what's cool about that is I'm about to bloom my Caligium, or Cal Caligium, however you say it, the one uh, from Brazil. 
and try to cross them because these native ones have the purple hearts on their leaves and this one hasn't formed its purple heart very well uh, maybe this one has right now they just look like skid marks <laughs> but on a big old lush plant uh, that's got sun you'll see these perfect purple heart-shaped blobs uh, on the leaves whereas the the ones from brazil and stuff have more of this like rainbow red and orange and peach and green thing going on so that's that let me wash my hands real quick and then we'll chat for a moment friends Ba -da 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 -da. Gotta go outside. Cause my wife is sleeping. Now we're outside with my wife's car. My favorite pet. So yeah, it's hot in that fish room right now. It's over 80 degrees, probably 70% humidity. And uh, as a fat Scotsman, it is not what I evolved for. Dutch, German, Scotsman. Uh, Jew, also. But... How's everybody doing? Uh, I knew we'd have an interesting mix of folks in here. Legacy Hobbyist, hello. Um, Tori Hiker, hello. Uh, Andrew Vaughn, what's up? What's the best way to promote shell growth and pitting cracking, in your opinion, in snails? Just to give them a good diet. Um, also have a KH and GH over three or four, uh, and not sky high, but that will pretty much mitigate any major issues you might have um j uh jabbo or jabbo jabbo uh thanks man you loving what i'm doing lately that is awesome uh ruby tetras are like ember tetras in size and temperament maybe a little shyer and um um but they are more sensitive to the water being low TDS, soft water. Um, yeah. And, yeah, I agree. Bloodworms are not a great food for all fish. Uh, for nano fish, they're probably not even one that I'd recommend highly. Uh, they're a little too big. You need to cut them up uh, for them to work well. Um, yeah. Fish Rob, what's up? Uh, just put your umbrella tree cutting rooted right on. Uh, Imperial urchin. I don't... Oh, yeah, you've got salt water. You and your salt water. You guys and your salt water. Um, so, yeah, guys, I just figured I'd share my... I don't know, every three times a week or so, I do that feeding routine... That's kind of what the, what everybody gets. And then every night, the elosomas and the uh, any of my wild-caught fish that Lucas, uh, or not Lucas, Lawrence Kent brought me from Africa or, or Madagascar or uh, uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, Borneo. Boy, he brings me cool stuff. Uh, I'm lucky he lives in Seattle. But... Um, they kind of have to have either worms or mosquito larvae or something that I go out and I harvest uh, from my yard or from my Daphnia tubs outside 
or from a brine shrimp hatchery, you name it. Um, and brine shrimp, live brine shrimp would probably be the a better food um, than frozen Daphnia is uh, in this little mix that I've been uh, preparing tonight. But, um, you know, I, I like to have a, a method that I can tell people if, if need be, if I'm out of town, people can replicate. All right, eight little uh, blister pack squares of this, cubes of this, and um, this much half a, a brick of the blood worms in the pack, you know, whatever. Uh, so, yeah. Hey, Gloria, what's going on? Richard, what's up? Um, oh, revise for your exam studying, huh? Uh, well, good luck. Uh, I hope everything goes great with your exams. Uh, definitely. Well, guys, I'm, uh... I don't have a ton to say tonight, but I am kind of stuck in that I was going to make a, a video to put out tonight, like work on it all night and have it ready by morning, and I was thinking, okay, well, I did hard water plants, let's do 25 uh, soft water species, and that still may be what I end up making, uh, but now I'm just torn on, on what I want to be making next for content and I'm a little bit torn if I go by my gut versus if I go by what YouTube tells me people are engaging with um, and it has to kind of be a happy medium of like do one this way one whatever I want one in between the two one this way one whatever I want um, and I tend to do that but right now I'm also having a little bit yeah all plants like soft water yeah exactly i know luke i could just make my favorite plant list but most people want a list and there are some that like will not halt tolerate you know hard water and that's really what i mean is like plants that can't take hard water uh because i did a 25 plants that will take hard water like a pro well, and look at that, guys. My battery's actually at 7%. So the phone's going to do that thing where it gets dim in another 2%. So I'm actually going to sign off. But thanks for joining me and hanging out and watching on this silly, silly vertical uh, stream. Uh, stupid camera won't let me rotate uh, when I stream th straight through uh, YouTube. But a lot of my videos now I've put together in playlists... And, uh, they are in podcast format through YouTube Music now. And there is a 70 or 80, uh, episode listening thing, including Fishery, uh, episodes, which actually are four episodes in one, uh, with news and science. And they are, um in that format if you want to listen to it and you've got uh youtube music or if you want to listen to ads and have youtube music um but if you've got like youtube red or whatever it's called the the pay paid youtube uh it's like 10 bucks or whatever then you get um a certain amount of memberships and i think you get uh free listening to the new podcast thing so yeah um but yeah, um, let me know if you guys watching this in the future, now, you guys here, whatever. Um, if you want a certain subject covered, I still want to do more botanical deep dives. I still want to do, you know, species spotlights, things like that. But what I feel like I've been lacking is lately I haven't talked about the history of the hobby in the sense of, like, picking an ichthyologist from history and talking about all the fish they discovered. And it's been because lately I've been so busy first traveling and then now I've had, um, you know, I'm talking to Oliver um, right now about doing a stream together, an interview. And then also I'm talking uh, with... Hans, who is just here, Hans Evers, who came and actually toured my fish room, which is kind of cool. I put posted pictures in the community tab uh, for everyone. They'll probably get 
set to like member mode or something uh, tomorrow, but I figured I'd put them up for a little bit, share that, because I was very honored that he was interested in seeing all the immersed growth and the deep substrate tanks that I had, because uh, I figured this guy has been to 180 countries or something. I mean, he's been all over the world, and he's published over a thousand articles since the early 80s, uh, and papers. He's, uh, he's got 11 books published by him, uh, and I didn't think that guy would want anything to do with this silly little fish room of mine, but, uh, apparently he, he found that, and my red root floaters, he was like, how do you get them so red? I, I don't understand. And I was like, no nitrogen, no iron, and he was just like, but the iron, does it not make him red? And I was like, oh, I have a YouTube video for you. He's like, oh, don't watch the YouTube. <laughs> so, uh, we'll have to convert him to a channel viewer at some point. But, yeah, he gave a talk on the Malawa shrimp, which he is the person who popularized. He introduced them to the hobby in Europe. And uh, they kind of entered Seattle only through Steve Waldron and maybe San Francisco, I'm not sure, um, in the 90s because Steve of Aquarium Zen went and studied under Amano. And Amano had specially paid, you know, being a millionaire artist, he had specially paid to get those Malawa shrimp. Now, I talked to uh, Hans and he said that there are no blue lines of those shrimp in Europe or Asia that he's ever seen and he's been a judge he's he's been all over I've also talked to a number of people who were at the shrimp ex or the uh, aquatic expo in Charlotte uh, or North Carolina that um, were judges from Singapore. There was a group from Singapore and they actually stopped by and also looked at the blue Malawas and were uh, surprised that anybody had wasted eight years on that. No, that anybody would, would uh, do that for such a subdued color tone rather than like a pop of solid color. So yeah, um, that's all I got. Those are my stories for now. Um, but much love to all of you. I hope you all have a wonderful morning or night or whatnot. Probably going to get some rest, then maybe start up working on a video or something. And uh, I'll talk to you guys later. Thanks so much for joining me. Have a wonderful night.